Hello, this is Michelle Miller, and today we are going to be talking about biodiversity. And in the introduction in their chapter on this section, they talk about the Biosphere 2. And this was an enclosed system that was about a little over three acres in size. And in 1991, they locked eight people in there. And the goal was for these eight people to survive in this closed system for two years. And so the system looks something like this. And it was in Arizona and it contained different types of biomes in it. And the idea was is that these biomes would create their proper atmosphere as well as nutrients that these individuals um, needed in order to survive. So the interesting thing is, is that this project didn't go very well. Um, the problem is, is that we really don't know what combinations of species are required. So this would be like you know, um, a precursor to building that biosphere on Mars, right? And we can't even do it on the planet, on our on Earth, without it um, crashing. So what tended to happen is, is the first thing that happened is, is that decomposition in the soil actually started to decrease oxygen levels. So you can see that oxygen levels slowly decreased. And this should be, you should be familiar with this idea because of um, the decrease in dissolved oxygen in the um, in the excuse me in the lakes, when you add nutrients, first you have an algae bloom, then the decomposition uses a lot of oxygen. So they actually had to um, put oxygen into the system before the end of it, and they also had to um, uh, remove some of some of the carbon dioxide. So not all of the carbon dioxide. Um, uh, was able to um, be removed naturally. And nitrogen gas was also a problem. So it was kind of interesting because they chose to bring in morning glories. And um, morning glories are pretty, um, can, can be kind of invasive. And so the morning glories kind of took over all their food. They had po insect pollinators in there with them, but the pollinators all died. And they ran out of food because the flowering plants did not produce fruit because they didn't have any pollinators. Okay, so when we look at biodiversity, we can talk about the number of species. And so we can estimate the number of species on the planet. And I found it interesting to note that there's actually far more animal species than there are plant species. So when we look at in animals, known to science and named, we have 1.9 million species. So that's known to science. And we think that there's about three to six million left to be discovered. And this is as opposed to plants where there's still a lot, 400,000 species, but there's only believed to be about 400 and maybe um, 50,000 total. So there's 50,000 left, left to be discovered. Um, and then when we look at the number of species, you have to realize that at any given time on the planet, the number of species is kind of a balancing act between species being produced and species going extinct. So this is a balance between the total number is a balance between speciation, which is the production of species through evolution and extinction. Whereas where we get like the last individual of a given species dying off um, without reproducing. Okay, so that's kind of a balancing act between those. And if we look at speciation, in a little bit more detail. Oh, here, let's actually look at, so this is actually this inner um, uh, pie chart, the inner pie chart, so that would be including all of this, is the number of species that is known, and then the outer pie, ch pie chart is the number of species left to be identified. And so you can see that insects, huge amount of insects we still have left to identify. <laughs> And um, compared to say, for example, um, viruses, which are this yellow, this is what we think, or maybe that's, actually maybe that's viruses. And I wanted to show you plants. So plants is right here, right? 
So we still have a lot of animal species left to be identified. Um, chordates, we are actually chordates because we're in we're vertebrates. And so that would be that tiny little sliver right there. That's the number um, known and the number left to be identified. Okay, so speciation is the production of new species. Oops, new species over time. Okay, so this is a slow process. Unlike the movies where they show these huge leaps of evolutionary, you know, um, organisms evolving huge, um, we, we now know that it is a relatively slow process. And so we can actually estimate the speciation rate. And so if we look at in um, birds, so in birds, there is 0 0.15 new species produced each year. So not even a new species, not even one, just a fraction of one, 1.5% one, um, per, 1 of a species is produced each year for every um, species, bird species present. So this is for each bird species present. Oops. And this is kind of an interesting um, estimation because the more bird species present, the more the um, new species will have because birds are constantly using new environments, going into new environments and evolving new adaptations, and then they become reproductively isolated from each other. And so it is a slow process. When we look at this as opposed to extinction, extinction is interesting because it is very common. And um, if we look at all the, uh, all the species on the planet, 99% of all species that have been on the planet are now extinct. So if you look at the geological record, for example, there was once an age of fish. So fish were super abundant. Um, and so that would have been before there were um, um, amphibians or reptiles or mammals. And then we see that there's an age of amphibians and amphibians are super abundant. There's all kinds of species, weird, huge salamanders, right? That roamed the earth. And then those went extinct and they were replaced by the reptiles. And we know about the dinosaurs and the dinosaurs went extinct and they were replaced by mammals. And so when we look at all the species, almost all of them have gone extinct when we look at them over the whole lifespan of the planet. Um, but um, some of these, these extinctions are slow, um, oops, slow versus fast. Okay, so sometimes extinctions, you know, animals just slowly died out. And so the average lifespan of a species is four to five million years. So we can estimate that, for example, from the fossil record. So we can see how many years um, a particular organism is found in the fossil record. And um, so they could just slowly be replaced by a, another group, or in the most dramatic cases, they're fast. So the fast would be mass extinctions. So we have mass extinction events. And these are believed to be due to dramatic changes. So dramatic changes. So like, for example, meteor strikes. So that is believed to be the cause of many of our major extinctions that we see in the fossil record, including the dinosaurs. And um, so if we look at the um, oops, that's speciation. If we look at the, the mass extinctions over a period of time, there's one here, two, 
um, three, four, and then they would say that we're kind of in the um, fifth or the sixth, actually that's six, so one, two, three, four, we're in the sixth mass extinction um, event because um, the species are going extinct faster than they can be replaced by speciation. <coughs> okay. So we can talk also about background extinction rates. So these are the slow going ones rather than the mass extinction. And so we can see, um, kind of estimate um, how many species will go extinct in a given year. And so they think that there's less than one species per every million, per one million each year will go extinct. So that's kind of the normal rate of extinction. And so we know that species go extinct. We, they have gone extinct prior to humans being even present on the planet. But what we want to, um, in conservation biology, you'll note that I mentioned that we want to prevent untimely extinctions. And so this is extinctions due to um, specifically human disturbances. Um, and um, uh, humans are causing extinction rates to rise dramatically above what is normal, what the background extinction rate is thought to be. Okay. So we can talk about biodiversity, and um, I mentioned that biodiversity could be the number of organisms um, living in a particular environment, but we need to measure it. So we can measure it on three levels. The first level is genetic diversity. Okay. So genetic diversity is really important in conservation biology. Because when you reduce a population down to a few individuals, and then those individuals then secondarily become a whole new population, you have reduced their genetic diversity. So it's sometimes referred to as the bottleneck effect. So if I start out with like 1,000 individuals in my population, and I go down to five individuals, and then those five individuals give me rise to 1,000 individuals. That's a five, right? This is called the bottleneck effect. Okay. And this is, we would have, in this population, we'd have reduced genetic variation. So biodiversity is really, at the genetic level, it's really important that we have genetic variation because this is a, what allows um, organisms, populations to change in response to environmental conditions. Now, humans are not the only cause of this bottleneck effect. It's believed that cheetahs went through this um, due to viruses, a viral infection that wiped most of them out. And so cheetahs um, today are very much genetically identical to one another and they have problems reproducing because of that lack of genetic diversity. Okay. We can also look at species diversity. And this is a combination of species richness and this means that this is the number of species in a given area. Now you can have a lot of species, but you could have few individuals in that given group. So um, we also need to look at what is called species evenness. And this is the number of individuals in each species. And this is one of the things that you're going to be measuring when you do your um, lab this week. Um, you're gonna look at species richness and species evenness, evenness in forests um, after they, prior to being burned or half after they're being burned. And so it's gonna be related to um, fire as a disturbance. 
And so um, if we look at an example from your book, Community A has um, lots of, uh, well, it has three different species. So species richness is greater here than it, or excuse me, is less here in Community A than Community C. So C has one, two, three, four different species, right? So if I was to measure biodiversity on its richness alone, I would say that Community C has a greater biodiversity. But here, you notice that the evenness is greater here. So I would say, if I was just looking at evenness, I would say it's here, right? This one has fewer species than this one, and it also has less evenness. Evenness, So we could argue quite rightly that Community B has the less diversity, it's, it's less diverse, okay? So not only we kind of have to use both as a measure, um, the number of species and then the number of individuals in each species, which is referred to as species richness and species evenness. Okay, so we can look at the geography, which is how, um, where we see biodiversity being greater or lesser. And one of the things that we see is in the seas, because this is where life originated in the ocean, we actually have a greater plant and animal diversity than on land. So in the ocean versus land. Okay, we can also look at latitude. So it is greatest near the equator. It gets, um, the, the biodiversity tends to decrease as you move towards the poles. And one reason this for this is, is that you have um, more um, in the, if you're talking about land, for example, you have more microclimates in a rainforest than you do, say, for example, in a desert or in a tundra. And those microclimates actually provide um, environments in which speciation can occur because species could specialize and get adaptations for a particular niche. So bringing in the idea of niche is all the resources that an organism use. So in the rainforest, we have micro environments that create more niches and more organism undergo speciation. In the rainforest, for example. Okay. So this just shows richness as you go up. So it's greater in, in the United States down south. And as we move up, species richness, which is the number of species, actually decreases as we move up um, in our own country in the United States. And then we also notice that it's great here um, around the equator. And this is actually what is referred to as biodiversity hotspots. So this um, organization that put together this map identified these hotspots, and this is where you would have greater than expected biodiversity. So greater than expected biodiversity. And there's like 34 different regions of biodiversity hotspots. And so there's a push to use our limited conservation funds to protect these particular um, areas because they are so diverse in, um, in terms of species. Okay, when we talk about biodiversity, we have to talk about um, a special type of um, studying of biodiversity, which is called island biogeography. 
And island bi biogeography um, is specifically looking at, it was started out as actually looking at I islands like Caribbean islands. But then we realized that like mountains are actually islands. The mountain tops are actually islands because it separates one mountain from another by a valley. And then you can actually also look at island biogeography in water. So you can look at lakes and um, lakes can be isolated from one another. They can be islands within the larger terrestrial landscape. So island biogeography is interesting and we see some interesting relationships. So one relationship we see is that with increasing size, you get an increase in species diversity. And that makes sense because an increase in size um, will actually um, give you more environments, more micro environments, right? And um, it tends to increase the diversity. We also see that um, distance from mainland plays a role here too. So in general, the more the increase in the distance to the mainland, the less diversity you get because organisms must disperse. Okay. The other interesting thing about island biogeography is, is that we tend to see an increase in speciation. And this is due to populations becoming isolated from one another. And eventually becoming different species. So even if they came back together, they would not interbreed. So those are some ideas that came out of the study of islands. And so if we're looking at lizards on the Caribbean island, um, on the, in the islands of Caribbean, Cuba is larger in terms of area, and it also has more species of amphibians and reptiles than the smaller, like Jamaica and Puerto Rico are smaller. So they would have fewer by half the number of amphibian and reptile species. Okay, so we can talk about different functions of biodiversity, and we can talk about um, kind of what type of um, mindset we're approaching this from. So we can talk about what is called a biocentric viewpoint. The biocentric viewpoint is, is that species have a right to survive outside of their usefulness to humans. Um, but oftentimes that type of um, viewpoint isn't what tends to drive people to preserve. Sometimes it is, but we can also talk about an anthropocentric, anthropocentric view. And this is, is that um, species have um, a purpose, a value, as they relate to what they do for humans. And so um, we can talk about the um, importance of biodiversity from that point of view as kind of arguments for why we should con um, conserve species in the first place. So this is um, species um, uh, have a role in helping humans To survive and that is their that is their value is, is that they have a role in helping humans to survive so we can look at the these different roles and we can talk about um, the importance of them 
And one example um, of this is, is that, um, so an example of this viewpoint, anthropocentric viewpoint, is, is that as we increase biodiversity, in say, for example, a forest, we increased net productivity. So this is the idea that more um, biodiverse um, ecosystems are more productive. So a forest, it's believed, I guess it depends upon the tree, but the more diverse a forest is, the more the prim net primary productivity that is gonna be. And so that's a value of biodiversity. So if we look at some examples of these ecosystem services to humans, one is, is that um, they, uh, trees produce oxygen. Okay. They help in soil, uh, biodiversity helps in soil formation. So if we look at worms, the formation of soil, microorganisms also help to break down um, organic material and form soil. Water purification. So as water moves through the soil, toxins are removed. So for the production of fresh water would be an ecosystem service. Pollinators are really important and they're in the news a lot because the European honeybee is um, uh, experiencing colony collapse um, that appears to be related to a new type of um, pesticide that we are, and herbicide that actually is a pesticide that we are, maybe it's a herbicide, the neonicotinics. It's a new chemical that we're releasing into the environment. Um, we could also talk about food insurance. So um, there are periods of time in our, in our history, like the Irish famine, where the food became um, susceptible to disease and the food um, crashed, our food system crashed and we didn't have food. Um, so food insurance would be like having seed banks. And the famous one is actually up, up, up in the, in the North Pole. They have a seed bank in, buried into the ground where they sh have shipped seeds from all over the world. And these seed banks are our insurance in case our crops start to fail because of a new disease organism. Perhaps we can take some of these seeds that might have genetic diversity in them that would allow them to survive and we can take them and use them for food. And then obviously plants and some animals can be used for medicine. So they just discovered a frog species that exudes in its slime mucus um, an antibiotic that might be really important in um, treating bacterial infections that are antibiotic resistant. So these are some things that biodiversity does for us. Um, we can also look at biodiversity um, and what a species might do for other species in its community. And so in the previous week, we've looked at keystone species. And these are species that are seem to be disproportionately important to the ecosystem. So specifically important. And so this is an example of where it's specifically important to other species. And this is called the gopher tortoise. And it's a um, ecosystem keystone species in Florida. And it um, builds burrows. And these burrows are super important for other species. So if these burrows are not present, then what we see is kind of a collapse of the ecosystem where we see um, reptiles and amphibians and mammals um, and even birds like uh, burrowing owls um, and gophers um, um, and gopher frogs um, decline because of the lack of um, the gopher tortoise. So we'd say that this is kind of a biodiversity um, ecosystem service, not just to humans, 
but it's an ecosystem service to other species is building of these burrows is important to other species, not humans, but important to other species. Okay, we talked about those. Okay, so let's look at the threats to biodiversity. So some of the threats, um, the, one of the big, big threats is habitat destruction. And this is why conservation groups, non-governmental conser conservation organism, organizations get donations from the public and then they buy up land or they pay governments, other governments of other countries to set aside a given amount of land to conserve. So habitat destruction is a major threat to biodiversity. We can also have kind of in the same vein as habitat destruction, we could have habitat fragmentation. And this is the breaking up the habitat into smaller pieces. And this could be due to roads. It could be due to fences, right? It could be um, due to, um, what would another be, habitat fragmentation? Um, well, logging, I guess put logging, where we clear cut part of the forest, right? So an example. Okay. And so what habitat fragmentation does is it creates edges. And edges have a different microclimate. There's more light, for example there than there is in the inside of the forest. And some of the organisms cannot survive on the edges. And so you tend to see decreased biodiversity as you move towards the edge. And you also tend to see a different community of organisms at edges than you do in the middle of a habitat. So um, in your book, they have a picture of this habitat and they're looking at um, fragmentation and the edge effect. So um, as we um, have a greater size of forest, we have more species. So a larger forest will support more species, right? When we look at the forest area, when we start to break it up and patchwork like this, there's tons of edges here, right? And so this tends to be worse for biodiversity than if you just broke it up where you like clear cut, right? maybe one big area or you, you put a, um, you remove that area. Um, that tends to be better than um, making really tiny, small patches. And one problem is, is, is that, and you're gonna uh, um, look at this later on in the quarter, is, is that you have to have organisms getting across and sometimes this creates islands, right? So how do, um, organisms disperse from one patch to another and are they able to disperse from one patch to another or, at, or are, are you just creating islands where populations are kind of stuck in time and place? Okay, another um, effect or threat to biodiversity, so the third one, um, would be alien species. So alien species are not native. And so they can be invasive. And it's generally thought that alien species are invasive, um, which means they outcompete native species because in the new environment, they don't have anything that inhibits their growth or reproduction. So they outcompete native species, okay, so they may be less affected by disease or predators in their new environment. So a rather scary example of an alien species um, is the Python, oops, is that the one I wanted? Oh, somehow I've missed that, sorry. Thought I put that uh, image. So in Florida, there's these pythons, 
that were once pets and um, pythons have been released into the Everglades, for example, into Florida. And they've reproduced and they think there's like maybe 10,000 of them in the environment. And they are kind of wreaking havoc on these snakes, these large snakes, these constrictors are wreaking havoc on the um, mammal population in Florida um, because they are an alien species and nothing, there's nothing in the environment that um, uh, kills them um, naturally. And so they tend to be very, very successful in this environment. Okay. The fourth thing that can affect is hunting or harvesting. Specifically, overhunting or overharvesting of a particular species or group of species can lead to decrease in biodiversity. So our fisheries are becoming very depleted. Um, this is that's not the fisheries. Oh, maybe there's fisheries right here. Okay, so this is actually um, fisher uh, aquatic animals. Right, so we're depleting the ocean. Uh, our rate of ex uh, exploitation is greater in aquatic environments right here than on land, right? And then notice how when we exploit things on land, it's the top predators that we're exploiting, whereas we might exploit the carnivores here. So this could be like tuna, and then this could be like dolphins. And so we take less, we exploit dolphins less than we do tuna, although sometimes we catch dolphins accidentally in our nets and that creates another problem of bycatch in an aquatic ecosystem. And then you're probably all familiar with the plight of the rhinos, right? And so one of the problems with rhinos is, is that um, they have these horns that are um, worth money and so you have people going into protected areas and hunting them illegally. And it seems to be that when we made the rhinos um, illegal, the rhinos to be poached illegal, we actually see a dramatic increase in the number of rhinos being poached. And this is believed to be due to the fact that we have created an underground black market for this. And so the rhino horn is worth a lot of money. And so you have people with very big weapons guarding rhinos now. And so there's some controversy over whether or not we should ban it or whether or not we should try to control their take. Um, so, you know, it's a really hard um, problem to solve. And it's the same thing with the elephants, the same problem with the elephants. So over harvesting of, for ivory. Okay, climate change will also, is also thought to going to be, have a dramatic effect on biodiversity. And so um, when we look at climate change, we already start to see that some species are being affected by it. Okay. So if we look at um, in um, a group of lizards, so this is lizards population, we see that species are becoming locally extinct in different areas as the temperature changes. And so we can predict that this is going to, as the temperature changes and this global warming increases, this rate of global warming increases, that you're going to see lizard populations just unable to survive in really, really, really hot environments. So notice Australia is going to be really affected. There's some really cool lizards in Australia, for example. And so um, climate change is going to accelerate the loss of, of species as species are not able to adapt to their ecosystem. Okay, so that is it for the lecture on biodiversity.